Hey guys, Trevor Morris here. Welcome to Ask Me Anything. Trevor, I hope this works. <laughs> anyway, just let me know if it doesn't, okay? Anyway, Trevor, I think I've known you now for almost 18 years. I think we first worked on uh, Last Samurai back in 02 and 03. And I have two questions for you. Uh, the first one, it seems to be at this period in film scoring, the two primary solo instruments with orchestra that are being used are guitar and piano. Is that because it's the background color that the directors or producers are comfortable with or that the temp tracks are featuring those instruments? And do you still feel you have the freedom to increase your color palette despite those preferences? And secondly, uh, when we worked on Of Kings and Prophets, uh, it was a small orchestra at Sony. And when I ever, whenever I went into the booth to hear playbacks, it sounded like a 90 or 100 piece orchestra. How'd you do that with a combination of synthesizers and and a, a few instruments in the uh, in the studio? Anyway, thanks. Hope this works for you. Bye. Thanks, Steve, for those great questions and that amazing compliment, which I'll circle back to in a minute. Uh, let's start off with who Steve or Doty is. Um, I'm going to go out on a limb and say that Steve is probably the best and most successful studio cellist probably in the world, but certainly in uh, our Los Angeles uh, recording orchestra. He is, we've been friends for a long time, as you mentioned. Um, he is, uh, and I might get this a little bit wrong and Steve can correct me, but I think he's the longest standing principal cellist for John Williams. Does that name ring a bell at all? Uh, something like 15 or 18 years or something crazy like that. So a very prestigious place to be. Um, you know, the, the, the thing that I'm always in awe of when I watch uh, all the musicians in L.A., and certainly like Steve, is their ability to sight-read music for the first time that they've never seen before. Uh, for those of you who don't know how studio sessions work, the musicians don't get to practice. Uh, they show up, the music's in front of them. He leads his section, and he also has an innate ability to listen not only to the entire surrounding orchestra, but his section uh, to know about imbalances. It's just, it's a bit of talent mixed with practical experience mixed with just years and years and years and years of seeing it all and hearing it all. Um, and so like all the great principal chairs in the orchestra, he's a fantastic asset to have in your back pocket because he'll, you know, he'll call up mistakes for, for a section or make a little suggestion because he just knows what works. So um, when you're on the podium, you want Steve right there to your right. Um, but uh, over to his question, uh, interesting about the, the guitar and the piano thing. Uh, I actually think right now that cello has become a, a very popular solo instrument. Um, I know Hilder has basically, you know, won every award he could win last year based on her playing her cello for Chernobyl and also, of course, Joker. Uh, I will say on the piano guitar thing that I find that a lot of composers are either piano players, like that's my instrument, or they're guitar players. There are exceptions, someone's an oboe player and things like that, but you know, like say like Tyler Bates, who I'm a massive fan of, um, he is a guitar player. So his point of entry into composing is to put a guitar or a guitar viol or bow it or pluck it or strum it. Whereas someone like me, my point of entry into composing is, is this guy. Um, you know, you think of someone like, you know, uh, a, a Tom Newman or, or James Howard who just have those sort of pianoistic things in their scores because that's just kind of how they express themselves. So I think uh, to answer your question, is it director driven? A little. Uh, I do think that certain composers are kind of known for having a guitarish kind of quality to their scores or having a more of a pianoistic kind of thing. Um, they, they never really seem to go out of fashion, I guess. You know, they endure for a reason. Um, but, you know, personally, I'm, um, I play okay guitar. Um, you can see I'm a guitar owner. That's what I call myself. Uh, but piano is really my thing. That's where I express my ideas. So they'd be more likely to be piano in my score than guitar in general. Um, of Kings and Prophets. So this was a little show we did for ABC 
And Don Soler, the great Don Soler, helped me champion to get some live musicians for this. It was kind of a, you know, ancient kind of biblical, you know, uh, score that we all felt needed the live orchestra. So where Steve's amazing compliment comes in was, you know, TV, the budgets on TV are not like films. So to get live musicians, you're not going to get a hundred piece orchestra. You're going to get 24 or if you're lucky, 30, you know, um, musicians. So my approach going into it was, okay, I knew exactly what the band was. I chose the, the sections and it was a more masculine score. So it had a good amount of cello and it had some, I had a, a bass trombone and a contrabass trombone, one of my favorite instruments to write for, and the French horns and all that. I knew going in, there were two things that I needed to do to make that orchestra sound the best it could. And as if you heard me in previous videos, I'm not a huge fan of blending samples into live orchestra, unless it's for an effect, like, like for a hybrid sort of thing. Um, I know there are a lot of composers who 50-50 is the starting point and maybe even more samples depending on what kind of score they're doing. I love the idea of recording with live orchestra so much that unless I absolutely have to, um, which is kind of rare working with, certainly with Los Angeles. I mean, the players are so spot on, timing, tuning, everything is just on the money. Even with a small orchestra for television with time constraints, and we did the whole thing in three hours or four hours, I knew that I wanted to sound as big as possible. And there were two things for me that were a priority in order to achieve that, um, and which is why Steve's compliment means so much to me because he's literally heard it all. Number one was... For my sound, my sound, for the way I like the orchestra to sound, there is the natural distance from the decatry, which is the, the three mics overhead of, the, of the, con, the conductor, proximity from the immediate circle of strings to the brass. So the brass are back on risers and there's a, there's a distance that gives them a less in your face sound and more of that heroic, it lets the room do some of the work for you. I mentioned before composers who I admire hugely, like Chris Beck, who's a friend, Danny Elfman, who prefer, prefer a drier, tighter sound, which is cool. I do that on occasion as well. But for this, I wanted it to sound as big as possible with not that many players. So I really wanted to I talked to my engineer, Jim Hill. This is a collaborative thing. I'm engineers involved, my uh, orchestrators involved, you know, the way I write, all that stuff. I said to Jim, I said, I want the brass pretty far back, like a lot further than you normally would. So they can really blare. And there's that little bit of a lag to the French horn and the way it excites the room. As you get closer, the strings are closer to the microphones. Yes, there's spot mics on everything I'm talking about. I balance the room with my ears first from the perspective of the podium because that's what the deck of tree sounds like. And I wanted to hear that heroic brass sound deep in the room. So I cast the studio that I wanted, uh, which is our biggest, one of our biggest, I think, Sony um, in Culver City, and it has a bit of a roomier quality to it. Fox is also amazing too. It's a little um, a little drier than Sony, uh, but Sony is a very big stage for not that many players. It's kind of unusual, but what we did is we positioned them in such a way that when the strings are doing action music, you could really feel the rosin and the bows, but when the, when the brass is blaring, it sounds further away. It's part of the hallmark of the scoring stage sound for me, for the kind of scores I grew up loving. So we spent more money on a bigger stage for few, fewer musicians. I actually think I had to cut a couple of musicians in order to make the budget work. And at first I, I thought it was crazy. Like, no, maximum players, here's your budget. Every dime should go to a player. I get that, but I knew in my head the sound that I wanted, which was that distant brass. That was number one. Uh, and the scoring stage was a big part of that and conversation with my engineer. Number two was a writing and orchestration uh, decision-making thing, which is like, I called my orchestrator, David, and said, listen, we only have so many players per group. I'm going to create some rules on the maximum divisi I would allow myself. For example, we had four French horns, I believe, or six. It doesn't matter, I think it was four. The maximum divisi would be two notes. So there's two players on each, you know, if it's a two note, let's say it's an open fifth, whatever, right? There's two in the bottom, there's two in the top. There was no three or four note divisis allowed. When you have 12 French horns, different story, that's when Steve Ardotti said that it managed to sound like more of a film scoring orchestra when he came in the booth was, 
really critical was from a conceptual point of writing to make sure that the divisis allowed for enough power in each section. This is one of the great things if you're a Jerry Goldsmith fan like I am, the efficiency of his writing and the way he does divisi and the way he uses sections in their sweet spots of their instrument is why his music just sounds so big and grand on top of the writing being amazing. So for example, let's say we had, um, I believe we had 16 violins, first and seconds. I did them antiphonal, which means instead of in the traditional uh, pie chart, they're like left and right for me. And I found that that has a bigger sound. It actually opens up some more room in the floor for the mics to pick up. That's another conversation. But let's say the first violins are doing a sweeping melody. Well, they'd be in octaves. That's a two part divisi. I love, capital L, love writing 10 finger divisi parts. I get myself in a lot of trouble with this sometimes. I just love that sound. It gets more translucent, and I just love writing you know, eight note string parts. On this project, can't do it. Can't do it. Um, got to make some decisions, and it was per section. Say I had 16 violins and I had, you know, whatever, eight violas. I think I had eight celli and four basses. So the basses were in octaves, maximum divisi, a lot of times in unison. This approach allowed each section to have enough strength to balance itself and fill the room up in, a, in a, an important way. If there was an effect I needed that I couldn't achieve with the orchestra, with the size of players I have, I'd do it with synthetics. I would do it with synths or patches or ethnic instruments, other things other than the orchestra. So that was a key part of it as well. And uh, I think that, and I agree with Steve, that I think that, that we did, the job was well done, that between choosing the right players, having Steve, of course, as lead cellist, um, and then having my friends around, which is they're here to help me make this sound the best it can. Um, a dialogue with my engineer, Jim, casting the right studio, having the players spaced out in an unusually deep way for the brass, more than they normally would be. All these little things that were conceptualized from the beginning, it, it was an effort to make it sound as big as it could. So as much as I appreciate Steve's compliment, and I do, it wasn't an accident. It wasn't, as, oh, wow, that sounds really big. You know, it was really well thought out. At least I, I tried to. Um, and that was, for me, the formula that made it work. So if you're in a position to hire a small ensemble um, and if you need it to sound big, which not every score needs to sound big, you can think about the room you're going to put it in, some spatial awareness. Um, you know, you think of a 100-piece orchestra at, say, like, like a like a Sony or at an Abbey Road or the big format rooms, just the physical distance between the brass and the whatever sixty or so string players, just by pure physical necessity, they have to be at the back of the room. Well, I recreated that with this huge space in between with no bodies, because the way the sound from the brass reacts to the floor, to the ceiling, to the mics, um, it just creates a different kind of sound. So that's how I did that. Um, it was a great learning experience for me. I didn't know 100% it was going to work as well as it did, but I was really happy with the result. So that's how I got there. Uh, and Steve will come in the booth and listen. He would go, wow, that sounds really big. And uh, yeah, I had my engineer on there. I gave him the brief. I'm like, let's get this going. We got the right room, got the right players, some forethought into orchestration as I'm writing. Um, and that together gave me the result that I needed. So. It was in the never-ending learning of this career. It was the first time I had done it that way, and now I know I can do that. So it's like, oh, got it, you know? Uh, how to make 30 players or less sound like 60 or 90. Bit of a stretch there. Uh, yes, you can push the samples in, and it creates a different kind of sound, but that I always knew I had that in my back pocket if I needed it, uh, you know? But I wanted to start with organically from the concept of writing, orchestrating, recording, the room, the mixing, all that stuff. So great question, Stephen. Great compliment. Thank you so much. It means a lot coming from you. Um, you know, this is a musical type of question, which we've been doing a lot of tech stuff recently. So I know there's been some requests when we get into the musical side of things, so I'll get to that. But for now, this was a fun one to answer, and I haven't relived that score. I was listening to it today to find a piece of music for the end. But um, it was a short-lived TV show. Unfortunately, that's the TV gods choose, not me. But I had a ton of fun writing it. Um, and I have to thank Don Soler for backing me up and getting me live musicians uh, and Chris, the executive producer as well. So that was a fun one. All right, guys, that was a fun question to answer. Ask me anything rolling on. 
Bliver synd.